All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC213, our course on the end times. Thank you for joining the class. Can somebody please pray? And then we will get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this day, O Lord Father. We thank you for everything that you have prepared for us, O Lord Father, for this day. Lord, we submit ourselves into your mighty hands. Uh, guide us with your spirit, O Lord Father, to learn, O Lord Father, whatever you are uh, sowing into our hearts, O Lord Father, Jesus. Uh, uh, we ask and we believe, O Lord Father, it will uh, grow and uh, produce uh, 30, 60, and 100 folds in our lives, O Lord Father, to be useful and uh, to be a blessing for your kingdom, Jesus. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we are just doing an overview of the book of Revelation. Um, we started this um, last week. We, we said uh, Revelation 1, chapter 1, sorry. Uh, John is having a vision of the Lord Jesus. There's things that he's seeing. Chapters 2 and 3 are things that are, I mean, things that were happening in John's time, the seven churches. Chapter 4 and 5 is a vision. So from beginning of chapter 4 is the beginning of the seven years of tribulation on the earth. Okay. So chapter 4 and 5 is a vision of what will happen, what is going to happen in heaven, where there's, a, um, there, there's worship happening. And uh, the, all the saints are there. And then there is the opening of the scroll. Then we come to the earth. That is what's happening on the earth simultaneously. That's chapter 6, verse 1 onwards. Uh, what is happening here on earth? We see the six seals uh, being opened. And each seal is having you know something happening on the earth. Right? So we start from... Chapter 7, Revelation, chapter 7. You all with me? Okay. So, Revelation chapter 7, the, uh, John is saying that there are 144,000 Jews. Well, they are referred to in verse 3, Revelation 7 verse 3, as the servants of our God. The servants of our God. That means these 144,000 Jews are going to be serving God during the tribulation. They're starting in the beginning of the tribulation, 144,000 Jews. Uh, it does not mean that they're all staying in Jerusalem or Israel. They could be all over the world, right? but they're serving the Lord. And these 144,000 Jews have been marked by God. It says here, they have the seal, verse 3, Revelation 7, 3. The servants of uh, we have sealed the servants of God. So the seal in the New Testament refers to two things: it's, it's the name of God, and it's the Holy Spirit. Like you know, the Bible tells us we are sealed by the Spirit. Right. So that's another reason why we are saying that the Holy Spirit is going to be working on the earth. Because how can these people serve God without the help of the Holy Spirit? And especially in the tribulation. All the more you need the help of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So these, these Jews are sealed by God. Now, some people may ask, why 144,000? Why not 200,000, 300,000? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe for whatever reason, 12 tribes? Uh, for whatever reason, God has decided this number, 12,000 from each tribe. Okay? Why not 10,000? Why not 20,000? Whatever. We don't know. Right? Uh, 12 tribes, sorry, 200,000 from each tribe means you know, 12 times 12. So 12 tribes, 12,000, 144,000 Jews are going to be witnessing or serving the Lord during the uh, uh, tribulation. 
Um, we'll get into some details l later on next year. You know, like uh, there are, it's not exactly the 12 tribes. There's slight variation there. Uh, uh, Joseph and Benjamin are mentioned. Uh, so that, that little thing we will deal with next year. Okay. And then we are seeing chapter 7, the latter part of chapter 7, verses 9 through uh, 17. We are seeing that uh, there are a lot of people who have come out through the tribulation. Right? So you see, um, he's seeing all these people worshipping God. Then he asks the elders, who are these? Verse 13, who are these arrayed in white robe? Then he says, you know, these are those who have come out. Verse 14, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes uh, white in the blood of the Lamb. That they've come out of the great tribulation. That means uh, these are people who have been martyred. During the tribulation, and their souls, or the spirit and soul, is coming up before the presence of God. Who are, who are these people are joining us here in heaven? Where are they come from? Or oh, they've all come because they've been martyred here on earth. And uh, and he says, you know, they will. Uh, you have to be here, uh, and and God will wipe away all your tears and so on. So he's assuring them that. So we know that during the tribulation, there are people who are going to believe in Jesus, and they're going to be martyred for their faith, right? Then. Chapter 8. Let's go to chapter 8. Just We're just getting an overview. So there is the last seal, which is like a pause, a silence in heaven, seventh seal. And we also see that there's a lot of prayer happening. Revelation chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. There is a lot of prayer happening from the earth. The prayers are coming like incense uh, before the throne of God. They are the prayers of all the saints. They're coming up before the throne, and um, the angel is throwing uh, an in, um, uh, 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 the censer that's filled with this fire. He's throwing it to the earth, meaning there's going to be this uh, great uh, uh, prayer movement being caused on the earth. So we can say that there will be a lot of prayer happening. And then begin the trumpet, seven trumpets. Each trumpet, something is happening. Uh, first trumpet, uh, one third of the vegetation is burnt. Second trumpet, one third of the water. This verse number eight and nine. Uh, one third of the water is affected and sea creatures are affected. Uh, third trumpet, verses 10 and 11. Waters are becoming sweet. People can drink it. Fourth uh, trumpet, uh, there are all kinds of things happening in the heavenly heavenlies. Uh, the sun, the moon, the stars are being shaken. This is verse 12, chapter 8, verses 12 and 13. So all kinds of things happen. Then chapter 9, fifth trumpet, um, the locusts are released from the bottomless pit. Um, uh, we know that uh, these are demonic powers. They are, they are like scorpions given, uh, verse 3, chapter 9, verse 3. They are like scorpions. They are given power to torment people, except for those who are sealed by God uh, for five months. And people want to die but they're not able to die, verse 6, right? And then he describes, verses 7 to 12, he describes these demonic beings because they've been released from the bottomless pit, but in what form they are taking, how they are operating on the earth, is not very clear. John is only describing what he is seeing. It's like locusts with horse, like they are like horses prepared for battle, and uh, they have uh, fa faces, crowns like gold, faces like the faces of men, and so on. He's describing that, verses 7 to 12 of Revelation 9. So, like I, was, uh, I, sa I said last week, some things we don't know for sure. You know, we know, okay, from the bottomless pit, demonic powers are released. How they're operating on the earth? Are they operating through human beings? Or uh, what is this exactly, you know, what John is writing here, verses 7 to 12. It is left, I mean, it's, you know, people can interpret it in so many ways. Uh, we don't have to fight about it, argue, because nobody knows for sure, right? So uh, you'll have different ex explanations. It's okay. We just listen and say, okay, that's interesting. Uh, but we don't know for sure. Okay. Then sixth trumpet. The river, uh, the demonic powers or angels are being released 
uh, from the great U river Euphrates, and there's an army of 200 million people, uh, uh, horsemen, who are uh, who are uh, stirred up, and uh, and and then he says, verse 17. Again, here you see something. There is fiery red. There is blue. There is sulfur yellow, and the horses uh, are like the head of lions. And there is fire and smoke and brimstone. One third of mankind was killed, verse 18, by fire and smoke and brimstone, which came out of their mouths. Again. We don't know for sure what exactly this is, right? John is writing, he said, I'm seeing something like, you know, horses and smoke and fire and all these kind of things. Uh, what exactly was that? We don't know, right? So we can imagine, you know, okay, maybe these are some missiles happening, atomic bomb. So when atomic bomb came, you know, when they discovered it and they dropped, uh, these atomic bombs, and they saw how it devastating it was. Then people say, "Oh, this is maybe this talking about that kind of uh, devastation, uh, uh, and so on." But we don't know for sure. Okay, but the the, the reality is uh, these things can happen in our day and time. Uh, we can have an army of two hundred uh, million, uh, even soldiers can be there, can be mobilized. Um, and we can have uh, weapons that, that, that seem like there's fire, smoke, and brimstone uh, that can destroy one third of mankind, one third of population being destroyed. We do have that kind of uh, weapons that can destroy. Okay. Chapter 10 is what we refer to as a parenthetical chapter, meaning this is not about something that is going to happen. But it is something about God dealing with uh, John at that moment. So what's happening? He sees a big angel who comes to John says, John, eat this book. Right? Um, so John eats this book. Uh, it is sweet in the mouth, but it is bitter when he gets into the stomach. And he's having this experience. And then the angel is saying, John, you have to prophesy many more things. Uh, so this is in ch chapter 10. And uh, he says, you, you have to prophesy about kings, verse, uh, verse 11. You must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. That means there's a lot more you have to write, or there's a lot more revelation coming. And this is about peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. It's, it's, it involves the whole world. Okay, So it's a parenthetical chapter, meaning it's not something that's going to happen, but John is experiencing it right then and there. Okay, now very important to note, chapter eleven, verse one, is the middle of the seven years. Chapter eleven, verse one. So you can say three and a half years over, another three and a half years starting. Chapter eleven, verse one, because it clearly tells us chapter eleven, verse one. I'll just read the first few verses. Then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. 42 months is three and a half years. So we know. He's saying, from now on, there's going to be 42 months 42 months uh, these gentiles are going to uh, uh, they're going to move in the temple and they're going to move in the city that means gentiles are going to overpower that city so that's why we know revelation 11 1 is correctly in the middle of the tribulus the 42 months the other things we can point out is revelation 11 1 and 2 he's saying there is the temple of god so there has to be a literal temple. Right now, there is no, no temple. But by the time you come to chapter 11, verse 1, there is a temple. There is an altar. Worship is happening. But it has now, at this point, it has been given over to the Gentiles, and they're going to desecrate it. Okay, Which means the temple had to be built sometime before. 
Right? So that's what we, we, we can say. At some point, the temple has to be ready. It will most likely be ready right at the beginning of the tribulation. It will get read, ready. And I can imagine, I'm not saying this is exactly the way it's going to happen. I can imagine that when the Antichrist comes, Revelation 6 1, he comes riding on a white horse, a man of peace. He is able to bring peace temporarily to the problem in the Middle East. And part of that solution is, and again, I'm imagining, I'm not saying, you know, this is exactly what's going to happen. Part of the solution is, let the Jews build their temple. Because the temple has to be there. So, as part of the solution, Jews will have their temple. And I think part of the solution will be these Palestinians will have their land. So both are happy. Jews get their temple, they get their land. I'm imagining. Because there has to be a temple. Okay? And uh, he's going to have a covenant of peace, a peace treaty, seven years. We'll do this. So he, is, uh, he comes as a, a man of peace. But Revelation 11, 1, middle of the tribulation, 42 months, 42 months over, 42 months left. What is happening? Everything is changing. In this temple, which is holy and sacred to the Jews, where worship has been going on, now it is being turned over, it is being desecrated. So we will see in chapter 13 that uh, this man, Antichrist, he sets himself up in the temple to be worshipped. Okay. Question. Yeah. So, um, for quite some time now, I think, I would think, almost, uh, actually, it's been a while. Um, uh, there is a website called um, the Temple Mount uh, something. I, I think I put it in the notes somewhere. Um, where they have been preparing for the temple. So it's been actually now almost two decades, I think, where they have got everything ready. Temple Institute, yeah, Temple Institute. So you can go and see. They've been they've done thorough preparation. They everything, all the utensils, the priests. Everything they need, it's ready. Even the plan, how to rebuild the temple, is ready. And I think, so a documentary, nice video was done. I think almost that, that video is almost, uh, uh, I'm thinking from the 1990s or something he had uh, produced, where he was documenting that how uh, these people, Orthodox Jews, they have made full preparation for the temple. And I think two years ago, they even had like a... Um, Kind of a sacrifice kind of thing, you know, but like, like you can say, like a practice thing they did uh, about sacrificing the 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 go the go like on the day of atonement, what will happen on that? So they had like a practice thing. So technically, the Orthodox Jews are ready, and I think they they estimate like within three months. They can put up everything, construct the temple, start everything. So much preparation is done. So if they're if they given access, they will re put, uh, put up the temple within three months. Or that very short time, because they have made thorough preparation. So you can read about this online, like they've done documentary. And also, it's almost like public information, like it's not a secret. But of course, from the other side, uh, also, there have been uh, quite a lot of uh, 
threats and opposition like hey if you dare do anything you know build a temple on this this place you know we will attack we will do this we'll do that so both sides have uh, you know have their own plans the arabs and the jews but here we are seeing chapter 11 verse 1 and 2 that there is a temple and at this point it is being desecrated the gentiles are uh, you know terribly destroying it i mean just i want to say dishonoring it. it says they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months the other thing we are seeing verse 3 god is in introducing his two witnesses i will give power to my two witnesses they will prophesy 1260 days 1260 days is 42 months so that means once again we know clearly this is the middle of the tribulation he's saying these uh, two prophets will prophesy 1260 days they'll be prophesying so we don't know exactly you know who these two witnesses are but uh, we can say in malachi 4 4 god said i will send elijah the prophet so one must be elijah then we say okay what is so unique about elijah he didn't die he was taken up to heaven so the only other person like that is enoch so we can say most likely the other person must be enoch but you know there's no chapter and verse for it we are just saying that most likely right so most likely these two witnesses one will be elijah one will be enoch and they are going to be prophesying and uh, uh, they will have, you know, they will, verse 6, they will have, they'll do supernatural things. They'll have power to shut up heaven, um, uh, stop rain. Uh, they will turn water to blood. They will strike the earth to plagues and so on. So they're going to do this for two and a half, uh, sorry, uh, three, 42 months, three and a half years. Then, verse 7, when they finish the testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. And the dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So notice something here. The beast that attends, ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Now, this beast is the Antichrist. Okay, It says he ascends from the bottomless pit. It means doesn't mean he's a demon, but he's a man. We will see in chapter 13. He's a man, but he's empowered by the devil. Right? So he's... he's He's empowered by demonic power. So that's why, you know, when you look, when we saw earlier in uh, chapter 9, it says, uh, from the bottomless pit, they came this uh, locust on the earth. And uh, the, 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 they was given power like scorpions of the earth. So locusts, and, so they're coming out of this bottomless pit. So again, they're, in what form are they going to express themselves on the earth? Is it like all these demonic powers are going to um, take on, you know, I mean, affect human beings and through them work or how they're going to express themselves on the earth? We don't know. But Revelation 11, verse 7, this beast to ascends from the bottomless pit. Uh, we will see later on in chapter 13 that this beast, uh, uh, he... Uh, is uh, is uh, the Antichrist who is going to do, you know, lots of lots and lots of things. Okay, so this beast, the Antichrist, he kills them, and their bodies are going to lie in the city of Jerusalem. But notice at that point, verse eight, Revelation eleven, verse eight, the great city. At that point, spiritually, is called Sodom and Egypt. Sodom known for its uh, uh, immorality, Egypt known for its idolatry, Jerusalem is going to be like that, meaning spiritually it's going to be 
like Sodom and Egypt. And the spiritual condition of Jerusalem at that time is going to be like that. Verse 9, peoples, all the peoples, tribes and tongues will see their dead body three and a half days. Now, we are living in a time when this is possible. Right? So you think about this. Uh, maybe, let's say, 20 or 30 years ago, this would not be possible. But how will people from tribes, tongues, and nations see their dead body? Today, you can have a live stream, live video, live TV. You can see. 30 years ago, not possible. You only have to read newspaper. That means you're not seeing live. You're not seeing them. Literally. But today, you can literally see. So it says here, peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies for three and a half days. That means we are living in a time when this can be fulfilled. That means we are getting closer to it. Yeah? And uh, then they're going to be very happy. Hey, these two prophets who were prophesying, they are dead. But it says, verse 11, after three and a half days, God's going to give life to them. They're going to stand on their feet. And uh, they will hear a voice come up here. And they will ascend to heaven in a cloud. And the enemy saw them. That means the people are seeing this happen. You can imagine cameras all on this thing and everybody's seeing this happen. They'll replay it over and over again. <laughs> because it's recorded. This is how what happened. You know? And and, and uh, there's going to be a great earthquake, and people are going to be afraid and they're going to give glory to the God of heaven. So this is going to happen at the end of the three and a half years. So, uh, this, this, this small portion about these two witnesses is really, in a few verses, he's describing what is going to happen from the middle of the tribulation till the end, the three and a half years. Okay? Towards the end of the three and a half years, these two prophets will be killed, people will see the dead bodies, and they'll also see them rise up and go into heaven. You're with me so far? Yeah? Then... There is a seventh tr trumpet. The seventh trumpet is announcing something that's going to happen, which is that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ, and there's going to be worship. So the seventh trumpet is announcing, hey, this is going to happen soon, very soon. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. Okay? And there's going to be worship happening in heaven. And John says, he sees the temple of God in heaven and uh, the ark of His covenant is seen in His temple. Chapter 12. Chapter 12 is again now at the middle of the tribulation. So chapter 11 was in the middle of the tribulation. It took us up till, till the end, saying, okay, this will happen till the end, and it comes back to the middle. Chapter 12 is again at the middle. Chapter 13 is also at the middle. Okay? In chapter 12, uh, and actually I'll tell you why be saying it's at the middle, because uh, he mentions that it's three and a half years I'll, uh, in chapter 12. I'll, I'll show that to you. But in chapter 12, Something else is happening. He's telling us what, how Satan is going to be reacting in the middle of the tribulation. But he's giving us a background. He says in chapter 12, he sees a great sign in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. And uh, she was with child, and she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth 
And uh, there was a great fiery, verse 3, a uh, fiery dragon. He had uh, seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems. Uh, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw it, threw it to the earth. Uh, the dragon stood before the woman, was ready to give birth to devour her child. Uh, she brought a male child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne, verse 6. Then the woman fled in the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God, and they should feed her there 1,260 days. Again, he's saying 1,260 days. That means that is 42 months. That is three and a half years. So that's what we're saying. Chapter 12 is again about something that's happening in the middle of the tribulation. But what's he talking about here? The, uh, first of all, we can we can start like this. Who is this male child? The male child, two clues he's saying. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's verse 5. And he was caught up to God and his throne. Who would, be, who would that be? He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. And he was caught up to God. And his throne, Jesus. Right? Jesus is the one who's going to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Right? You see that in Revelation 1 and also in Revelation 19. Right? Revelation 1. Um, where's, where's this? Where's this? He's a uh, verse uh, 5, he's a ruler over all the kings of the earth right and um, um, yeah so he's ruled over the wait, wait, it's just, um, okay uh, and uh, chapter 19 is very clear Revelation 19 and um, let's look at this verse here Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes, a, Revelation 19, 15, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. So the one who will rule the nations with a rod of iron is clearly Jesus. And he was caught up to God in his throne. So Jesus ascended to the throne of God. Very clear. Right? So this male child, this child, she bore a male child, Revelation 12 verse 5, that is, the male child is Jesus, then who can the woman be? Again, there's a clue. First of all, this woman is clothed with the sun and the moon, and there was a garland of 12 stars. So you think about the Old Testament. Somebody had a dream. The sun, the moon, and the eleven stars. Who had that? Joseph. Who was his father and mother? Jacob and uh, Re Rebecca. Rebecca. But Jacob represents Israel. Right. So this woman here. That's one clue. Sun, moon, twelve stars. Jacob, Israel. She gave birth to the male child, Jesus. So whom did Jesus come from? Israel. So the woman has to be Israel. The woman cannot be the church for these two reasons. One, the sun, the moon, the 11 stars is a picture that's used in the Old Testament about Jacob and his family, not about the church. Some people say the woman is the church. No, 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 it cannot be. Secondly, second reason it cannot be the church is because Jesus was not born from the church. He was born through Israel. The church didn't give birth to Jesus. Correct. So this woman has to be Israel, not Jesus. The male child is Jesus. We saw clearly two clues he's given. Again, two clues about who the woman is. Right? The sun, the moon, the 12 stars, and she gave birth to the male child. So she has to be Israel. And so here we also read about the red dragon. 
right? So he has seven heads that's representing authority, uh, 10 horns. We will see later on the, representing these 10 leaders who are going to be empowered by him. Seven diadems, again, showing his, you know, authority. Verse 4, Revelation 12, verse 4. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven through them to the earth. So this is talking about when Satan took one third of the angels with him and was cast out to the earth. So that's what we say. One third of the angels were taken with the devil. We see, get it from here, from verse 4. right? And we see very clearly that this dragon is satan we see this in verse 9 revelation 12 9 so the great dragon was cast out the serpent of old called the devil and satan so the great dragon is satan is the devil so what's happening in revelation 12 is revelation 12 is this verses 1 through 6 is a little background to what's happening israel jesus satan the dragon in the middle of the tribulation the devil, the great dragon, the dragon is going to do something. He's going to make one final attempt to try to go to heaven. Okay, that's he knows this is the end. So that's why verse 7 says, War broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. So verse 7 is what is going to happen in the middle of the tribulation. In the middle of the tribulation, Satan is going to make one final attempt to go. But Michael and his angels say, you cannot come. And what happens? It says, there, there, was no, there was found no place for them in heaven. And he was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. That is verse 9. And then it says here that... Uh, uh, Woe was 12. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. I mean, hey, this is it. I only have 42 months, three and a half years left. So he comes with great wrath, great anger. And what does he do? Verse 13. Now the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male. So that means he's going after Israel. How is the dragon going after Israel? Through the beast, through the Antichrist. So Satan himself is not like physically walking on the earth. He's, he's using this Antichrist to go after this woman, Israel. Verse 14, but the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, and she would be in the wilderness for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. Time, times, half a time. Three and a half years. You read this also in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, chapter 8. You will see that later. But this time, times, half a time is three and a half years. Time, one year. Times, two years. Half a time, half a year. Six months. Three and a half years. So... For three and a half years, he knows, uh, and he's going to persecute Israel. But verse 17 says, specifically those who believe in Jesus. Verse 17, and the dragon was enraged with the woman, that's Israel, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, that is all the Jewish people, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he's going specifically after Israel, but specifically after the Jews who follow Jesus. You understand? So this is another thing that's happening, starting from the middle of the tribulation for the, for the next three and a half years. The dragon, Satan, is going after these Jewish people through the Antichrist, attacking these people. So this is going to be very painful. So the Bible calls these three and a half years a, 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 a time of Jacob's trouble. It's a time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to suffer so much. Okay. So any questions till now? You understanding? Yeah, step by step. Chapter 13 is also happening starting in the middle of 
the tribulation. In chapter 13, we are introduced to the beast and the false prophet. Right? So verse th chapter 13, verse 1, I saw a beast. Now notice, this beast is having seven heads, ten horns. But we just read the dragon in chapter 12. The dragon is having this seven heads, ten horns. So that means this beast is the embodiment of this dragon. The dragon is the devil, the serpent, Satan. So this beast is actually the representative of this, uh, this uh, dragon. Verse 2, chapter 13, verse 2, the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So the dragon, which is Satan, is giving this beast, this man, his authority, his power, his kingdom. So this man, the Antichrist, is empowered by Satan, by uh, the dragon. Yes? When we are talking about this dragon, like when we see in other verses, when John was explaining few things, he told the smoke, uh, like uh, like uh, some kind of creatures then the in the other class last week we 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 you told like maybe there are some aircrafts or something like uh, so when we are when we are talking about this dragon also like how can we understand is it a like, literal dragon or any human made uh... okay so in chapter 12 the bible is telling us who this dragon is Right? So, chapter 12, verse 9, it says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Right. So it's telling us who this dragon is. So the dragon is Satan, the devil. So he's a spiritual being. And this dragon, so now we are seeing in chapter 13 and verse 2, the latter part of verse 2, the dragon gave him, that is the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. So dragon, who is the dragon? He's the devil, he's Satan. He is giving the beast his power. So as we read chapter 13 very carefully, we will see that this beast is actually a man because he is going to be doing things which only a man can do. Right? So that's why we can say confidently, oh, dragon is the devil because the Bible clearly said it. The beast is a man because he's going to be doing things that a man would do. So this man, the Antichrist, is empowered by the dragon. And this beast we saw in uh, chapter 11, he's the one who kills the two witnesses. So same beast. He's empowered by the dragon and he's doing this. Right? So we read about the beast here, chapter 13, uh, that he was wounded, but his wound was healed, and all the world marveled, and they followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who was able to make war with him? And then look at verse 5. And was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Again, middle of the tribulation. So this is happening starting from the middle of the tribulation till the end. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and overcome them. And authority was given to him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So this beast now, we see, see he has human characteristics because he's being killed, or you know what, what we it's usually interpreted as an assassination attempt on him. They try to kill him, but he has a wound, but he survives. So people are saying, oh, this beast must be very great. And all, and he's speaking blasphemies against God. 
and he's having authority over nations and tribes and tongues. So obviously he has to be a man who has was having all this influence over so many nations. And people are beginning to worship him. And through him, they are worshiping the dragon. You understand? So that's why they're saying that this beast is actually the Antichrist, a man. He's speaking things against God. He's having rule over authority over the nations. And um, through him, people are worshiping, actually worshiping the dragon. Okay, so we'll pause here. But remember, it says here 42 months. Right? Um, and so, again, this tells us clearly that it's going to be in the middle of the tribulation, verse 5, right? 13, Revelation 13, 5, for 42 months. So, starting from the middle of the tribulation, this is going to be happening. Okay, so we'll just take a break. We'll come back and we'll continue from uh, verse 11. Question? Chapter mm. We see the verse eight, uh, and uh, it's written like uh, it's uh, written about when the uh, the dragon the Satan goes for war. Yeah. Uh, they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. But we know even now they don't have the place in heaven. Yes. So how uh, we can uh, they don't have a place any longer. They already don't have a yeah. So what is it's uh, so it is describing so verse seven to nine is describing Satan making a final attempt, Satan and his demonic powers making a final attempt to go into heaven. Michael and his angels are saying no, no way, and this is it, no more. There will never be another chance for, for them to even attempt to go into heaven. Because what will happen? They are sent to the earth, three and a half years. At the end of the three and a half years, Satan is bound for 1,000 and his demons are bound for 1,000 years during the millennium. So that means three and a half years, short time. After that, when the Lord Jesus comes, Satan and his demons are bound for 1,000 years. No chance at all. Then at the end of the thousand years, they release for a very brief period of time. We don't know what that brief period of time is, but the time is very short. And they're not no chance of going to heaven. They only try one final attempt to attack Jerusalem. That's it. So what we're reading here, Revelation 12, 7, in the middle of the tribulation, that is the last and final chance that they have even to try to get to heaven. No chance after that. So no longer from there anything. So they have, Satan was already cast out along with one third of his angels that we read about the um, uh, he, uh, was, was four. He took um, one third of the stars and threw them to the earth. Right? So that means they sometime in eternity past, they were cast to the earth. And Jesus said, you know, Luke 10, 17, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Jesus saw that it was in the eternity past. Since that time, there has been no place in heaven. Right. And here, it's their final attempt to try to go in, but there's no chance. Because uh, in Job we can see that the enemy goes into uh, uh, presence of God and uh, asks him. So, is there chance like access for them right now to go into heaven and attack? No, uh, to have some conversation with God. Yeah, I know in Job uh, there is that conversation. Like God says, you know, Satan, have you seen Job, my son? Now, we don't know for sure is if Satan is given access to heaven. Right? 
that's one instance where we have this record. Uh, but let's look at it like this. God is so holy. Heaven is such a holy place. Can or would God even allow Satan to come there? My thought is no. But then how can God have a conversation with Satan? Well, God is omnipresent. Right? So, he doesn't have to let Satan come into heaven to have a conversation with him. He can talk to Satan wherever he is. Like for example, God speaks to you and me. Does that mean we are all going into heaven, having a conversation coming? No. God is speaking to you. God is speaking to me, where I am, where you are. Because he's omnipresent. So we say, God spoke to me. You went to heaven? <laughs> you. Uh, speak like on the earth and unknown, sure, and uh, like they won't speak, they won't have this conversation if they are on the earth. Maybe we can take you like this. The heavenlies. So we have. So remember, um, there is the atmospheric heaven. There's a spiritual heavenlies, and then there is the heaven of heavens or the third heaven where God is, where God's throne is. So this probably took place in the heavenlies. Again, I'm saying probably because I can't imagine like God letting the devil come into his... Why should he even let him in? Right. So yes, conversation took place as recorded in Job. But where did it take place? Most likely in the heavenlies, not in the throne room of God. You know? See, there's only one example we have. Right. Uh, which yeah can give a lot of questions, but if people interpret it, it can go off in many different directions. But I think we just have to think, you know, heaven is such a holy place. You now who can, like the psalmist says, who can ascend to the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Okay, if if you're saying so much about man, then what about the devil? Is God going to let him just freely come into his presence? No. So that's just my analysis. And we're not necessarily saying this is exactly how it is, but my thought would be like this. So I wouldn't uh, you know, build a theology saying, okay, Satan is coming in and out of God's presence. No. Yeah. All right. So let's pause here and we'll come back and continue. Thanks.